Hey everyone, and welcome to another CTF write-up video. Today we're going to be talking about the MJS challenge from Kalmar CTF. This was a browser pwn challenge, and I'm going to be talking about two different solutions, a smart way to do things and a dumb way to do things. And during the CTF, I definitely did the dumb way to do things. Um, with that, let's get started. So like I said, it's a browser exploitation sort of challenge. Uh, specifically, we need to get shell on a box that is running this MJS uh, binary. Um, and it's a publicly available open source sort of uh, JavaScript engine. Um, it's written in C++ and it just provides like a JavaScript interface. Um, like I said, there's going to be a Ubuntu 22.04 box. It's just going to be running this. And our goal is to somehow get shell and read the flag off of uh, the root directory. So to make this challenge even more fun, uh, the challenge author actually included an additional patch on top of uh, the normal MJS installation. And what they did was they removed a couple of the functions that would have made this too easy. And so they removed the FFI, FFI CB free, make string, and S2O functions. And so normally these functions would be callable from the JavaScript environment, but we're not allowed to call them anymore. Um, and they also removed this if condition um, from here. Uh, so what they specifically removed, this FFI function, so this is foreign function interface, and it is a way to call C, C++ libraries from a different environment. Um, I've only ever used this in the context of Python. So in Python, you could use it to load in like a, a .so file, a shared object library. Um, specifically, I think there was a reversing challenge a while ago where my solve script was written in Python, uh, but the actual challenge binary uh, was in C++, C++, but it was using random from C++. C++ and the, the random on Python does not match the random on C++. C++. And so you can use this FFI to like get the actual output from C's random while still continuing everything in your Python script. Um, so but the thing to note is this patch uh, doesn't remove the FFI function. It just doesn't make it accessible within JavaScript. So if we could find a way to still access this FFI function, we could call it uh, request the function for system and then directly call system uh, bin shell within our JavaScript environment. To see how this JavaScript interpreter works, uh, I created a little demo.js file. Uh, we're defining a function, hello world. Uh, a is equal to one, we're gonna print it, we're gonna call hello. And then to actually execute this, we call the MJS binary and we just pass it a file, so demo.js, and it executes it. So like it's like calling Node.js, for example. So A is equal to one, world undefined. This undefined thing happens because it returns the, the very last statement. So instead, if we put a five here, uh, we'd see it just returns five. So the trick to actually exploiting this binary was realizing you can do something like this. We're going to print the print function. We'll execute it, MJS, demo. And we get back so something called a foreign pointer and this address. And the fact that this address starts with the 55 is very suspicious. Um, if we load it up into GDB, we'll do run demo. Actually, first we need a break on main. Then we'll do run demo.js. We'll print out uh, MJS print. Cool. So we have the address of where the print function is within uh, GDB. Then we'll continue. And we'll see that the response of printing the print function will give us the same address as the print function in like you know normal memory. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, this foreign pointer that we access within the JavaScript is the raw pointer to the actual function. And it gets even crazier. We can actually use array accessors on this function pointer and start printing out values. So if we were to print out print zero, one, two, and let's say three. Let's run demo. Let's examine uh, four bytes at uh, MJS print. Cool, maybe actually we want unsigned bytes. So how you do it? There you go. We have four unsigned bytes. Then we will continue and we'll see these match up. So 85, 72, 137, 229, which is crazy. Um, so using this function pointer, it's basically just a arbitrary pointer into memory that we can do whatever we want. Um, and to kind of prove how crazy it is or keep going crazier. So again, we can then do print one. I'm just gonna offset it by one. So if it's correct, print one should, re these first two lines should return the same thing. And so using this, we can, if this works, we can do plus minus and jump wherever we want and access whatever we want. Uh, and let's just run it. We'll continue and we'll see that these match. So right now we have a gadget 
these function pointers, like I said, we can execute anywhere, we can read anywhere, and we can also, we can write anywhere. And to write anywhere, you just assign it equal to something. So we'd say equals five, something like this. I mean, you get rid of the print statement, but. So at this point, if you're smart, uh, you'll realize that the FFI function that was commented out still exists, and you can use that to uh, easily uh, exploit the binary. So what you can do is you can then take this, you can calculate the offset to the FFI function. So we know where uh, the print function is, because uh, we just saw it. You can figure out the offset between the print function and the FFI function is gonna be uh, the same every single time. So you calculate that offset. So let's say it's like, you know, X 2020 or something like that. Oops. So now we have uh, access to that FFI function. Then you'll call, I think, is it void system car star or something, something like this. So you'll ask for FFI for reference to the system function. And then all that's left is to call it. Um, the actual exploit looked like this. Uh, print, this is the offset between the two. Then you call in system car, bin shell, and you are done. And the actual FFI, we can actually calculate the offset. Um, make foreign function, make FFI call here. So this is the one we want. So if we go to print, we have this one and we also need mjs.print. Cool, and so then this is the offset. So you just subtract the two, minus two. Oh, I mean, you can do it the other way. So positive and you should be able to just replace it uh, here. Actually, let's just uh, print this out. And you'll see they match. So that's how you calculate the offset. Um, but yeah, we can run it, see that it works. Uh, MJS, exploit, and boom, we have shell. So if you're not smart and you forget that FFI exists, uh, there is another way to exploit the binary. Uh, it's a little bit harder, but uh, it is what it is. This is what I ended up doing during the CTF. It took me maybe six hours to actually finish because I did a lot of things wrong. Um, but the trick is instead of using that FFI, we can resort to traditional exploitation methods. Um, and so the things I was trying were one gadgets. Uh, I was overriding the global offset table. I was getting my info leaks. And so I'm quickly just gonna cover the my solve script. Um, like I said, FFI method, way better, but maybe if FFI is patched or they actually remove the FFI function, this is how you could exploit it. Um, so like I said, here's, uh, here's my uh, exploit script. Um, like I said, first I needed some info leaks. Uh, when we actually print out, uh, where's an example? Uh, when we print it out like this, so we're printing out the address of prints, um, we don't actually have that address within the JavaScript environment. We're allowed to do stuff with it, but we don't know what that address is. And during the CTF, uh, it was single shot. So you give it a JavaScript file and it executes it. You don't get like this challenge response sort of communication. Um, so first we needed to leak an address. Uh, it's not too hard. Um, so you can go to the global offset table uh, you don't know what the address of the global offset table is, but you can find the relative address between one of the functions. So between the print function and uh, some global offset table entry, and then you can read its value. And so once you read the value off the global offset table, uh, from there, um, you can calculate an address for both the main elf section, so the text segment, and one for a libc function. And the reason is uh, if we go to uh, let's see, GDB, MJS, um, we'll do break main, run, we'll just run PS, run demo. So if we look at the global offset table, um, actually, maybe we should go a little bit further. Are there any sevens? Uh, actually, let's break on exit then. Invalid instruction. That's strange. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, we'll see now that the program has actually run, we'll see some of the global offset table entries have been updated and some aren't. And you can tell because, so when you were, are, when you, the global offset table entry for free contains a 7F value, which is a value into libc, whereas the entry for put care uh, still has a 55, which is going into the PLT. And so if we were to jump to this address, again, it's a relative, relative jump. So we need to figure out the difference between this address and the print function which we just do once, uh, similar to how we calculated the difference between the print function and FFI. We read the value that's there. So if we were to read it for free, we do this one first, we'll get out this value. Then we calculate the offset between free and the base of libc. So we have our libc leak and we can do the same for put care. We'll go here, we'll read the value at this address. Um, we'll get back this value. 
Then again, we calculate the offset between this and the base of the main tuck segment. And so now we have a leak for uh, Lipsy and the main elf tuck segment. And so that's what I do at first. Um, I define these two functions. So this is an arbitrary read. You pass the read a pointer and it'll read it out. Uh, nothing too exciting. Um, it's a little bit tricky keeping track of what's a pointer and what's just like a raw address. Um, I, pointers are the, the function pointers and address is just uh, like a, an integer. Um, so use, like I said, I use the pointer. I just loop over eight times for one for each byte because I'm doing like array zero, array one, array two, and then I construct that leak. Um, the, I guess the uh, global offset table entries I used were the abort one. Uh, so this one, I guess, I used abort um, because it hadn't been called. Abort hopefully isn't called during normal program execution. Um, and then the one that had a libc leak that I used was put care. And I know put care was working because I was printing some stuff up here. So like I said, uh, abort. So I, here's the base pointer. So this points to the base of the elf segment. Then I add that character offset. Uh, I was being lazy here. Um, so I just knew it was one pass put care and I was using put care first. So I read that value in the global offset table. I subtract, again, you calculate, you just print out a bunch of values. This is the value between the abort function within libc and the base of libc. Um, and then I do the same for put care. So now I have, oh, sorry, I got this wrong. This is the one for the base address and this is the one for the libc. doesn't matter too much. So <laughs> here I'm printing out stack stuff. So at this point I had libc, uh, everything was all set to go. So what I was doing is I was overriding the global offset table with a one gadget. Um, if you watch any of my other videos uh, or read any CTF write-ups, you know, very common methodology, you'll take a one gadget uh, and you'll just overwrite a global offset table entry. And so when that global offset entry is called, uh, it'll jump to your one gadget. The problem is uh, so frustrating, it was stack alignment. Um, so uh, if you're on a modern version of Ubuntu um, or a modern version of libc, uh, they, they do some instructions that require the stack to be aligned uh, to 16 bits. Uh, the, the, last, the last byte needs to be zeros. And uh, it's frustrating because uh, for most function calls within libc, they always guarantee that. But when you do like one of these weird jumps directly into like the middle of a function, uh, it's not aligned like that. And so normally if we're wrapping, all you have to do is just add another return. And so then you just do return, that'll update the stack pointer correctly, and then you call the function. Uh, but we here, we don't have that return. And so I spent a lot of time just like overriding global offset table entries, like trying to figure out a way that it would like do a weird jump. And so the stack pointer would be aligned correctly so that the system call would work or the one gadget would work. Uh, I don't know, I probably spent like an hour like going through, like looking for clever little gadgets. I uh, couldn't find anything. Also, another thing to note is uh, this, this uh, syntax where you're like, able to call prompt functions. So we can do print like, you know, some offset and call it. What's frustrating is too, is uh, these don't get populated. So if I was to do this, these ones don't actually show up in registers. Um, a little bit frustrating uh, because you need like special code to unwrap these JavaScript objects and then put them into registers. And by default, if we just call this function pointer, it, it doesn't quite work as simply as one would hope. So execution, we can do raw execution, but our arguments aren't passed unless there's special code that unpacks our arguments. Um, anyways. So uh, again, I tried that. So I tried overriding the global offset table for a while. It didn't work um, with a one gadget. Then I was like, all right, fine, whatever. Let's uh, leak the stack out and let's uh, figure out where, let's just do a standard ROP um, where we're going to find a return address and we'll, the, a normal return address, we'll overwrite with a fake ret that'll increment the stack pointer and then we'll call into our one gadget. So the alignment issues will be fixed and we'll win. Problem is, this was very messy. Uh, it just wasn't reliable at all. I was hoping that it would be at a known offset so I can calculate the base of the stack. But for some reason, which I'm very curious about, if anyone knows why, I'd, I'd love to know why, um, the return function was not at a known offset on the stack, was not at a known offset from the top of the stack. Uh, it would change by maybe a thousand bytes every single time. So I had some code that would just kind of spray the stack with like return one gadget, return one gadget. Um, and I tried to like be careful so I didn't clobber too much, but it was just really messy and it was just very frustrating code to write. Um, I wasn't having a good time. Eventually I got a little bit more clever and I realized, uh, I remembered an, an older technique where part of the issue was we can't pass arguments um, to functions, but we could use an existing function that works correctly uh, and have it pass the arguments for us. And what I mean by that is 
what I did is I found the address to the F open. Uh, where is it? Uh, open 64. Sorry, just open 64. Actually, let me back up. There was another function in the uh, JavaScript runtime called load that you could use to load other uh, JavaScript files. Um, and I tried loading the Docker file in for a while because the flag should be in the Docker file. And I tried this, like I tried to convert all the symbols so they'd be valid JavaScript. And so maybe it would just error out on the actual flag line. Uh, that didn't work, uh, but it would be cute if it did work. Uh, instead, what I did is I overwrote this global offset table entry with the system call. And so now when I call load, load will call the normal load function within MJS. Um, and eventually it'll try to open that file, but instead of opening it, it's going to call system. But because we're doing like the normal pathway, uh, the stack will be aligned um, and it'll just like pass the whatever file we want. And so instead of call it, when I call load now on bin shell, um, instead of loading, it'll just call system on it. Um, and this ended up being how I actually exploit the binary. So like I said, way more involved. Um, very unnecessary. If you remembered FFI, it was definitely the right way to do, but it was fun. More of a traditional sort of uh, exploit chain. Um, but anyways, uh, fun challenge. Had a lot of fun. Um, and thanks. We'll see you at the next CTF.